Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us today uh, for this webinar about Foreground uh, version one, which we're releasing today. Um, I'm going to just run through a quick introduction and a few quick slides, and then we'll get into the live demo because I'm sure that part will be much more enjoyable for everybody. Uh, we are recording this webinar uh, and we'll make sure that it's available to folks for follow up after if anybody wants to rewatch it or if you want to see some additional parts. Uh, in replay, or if you want to uh, share them uh, with other folks in your office that couldn't make it today. I know one attendee reached out and said because of the time zones, if it was being recorded, that would be awesome. Um, so I'm going to just do a brief uh, introduction and then I'll turn it over to Lauren Schmidt, uh, who's going to be uh, doing the bulk of the live demo. Uh, so just to recap, uh, if you're not familiar with us, we're Parallax team. We're uh, a small group of five that all come from either the background in architecture or landscape architecture or software development. Uh, and uh, we specialize in helping firms excel at uh, you know, using their models to deliver better documentation uh, so that everybody in the project life cycle can benefit. We're very passionate about that. Um, and we all kind of came together uh, through wanting to leverage one another's talents to kind of achieve that goal. So real brief history, um, I just want to talk about site and landscape modeling in Revit as it's existed. Uh, this is a project that I had to model back in 2011 uh, in Revit. Um, it's an arboretum in Dallas. And of course, we did all of this with uh, Revit topography. At the time, we were using Eagle Point SiteWorks, which then became Site Designer. Uh, and there were some pros and cons to that application. It leveraged some kind of unique custom ways of modeling, but it was also very based on topography. Um, as the years went on, uh, we started getting involved in projects, particularly after we started Parallax Team, where there were some unique site features that didn't really lend themselves to using Revit Topo. Uh, one example is a project where there was a tunnel uh, and both the clearances above the tunnel and the thicknesses of all the objects in the landscape above the tunnel were paramount. Uh, and in this case, uh, we wanted to leverage basically solid modeling, whether it was uh, floors, roofs, whatnot. Uh, and then as the years went on, there are other projects that we've talked about a lot on social media, uh, whether it was the arena that we worked on in Fort Worth or whether it was the hotel complex that we worked on. Uh, both of those projects had complex landscape elements that were on top of structures. And in that case, of course, the thicknesses of all of those elements uh, really mattered extensively for coordination and making sure things were actually going to be buildable. About that time when we were working on the arena and we had to do the landscape modeling, we had kind of resigned ourselves to using floors or roofs because we needed the thicknesses and they were important. But a lot of them also had to be variable thicknesses at very distinct elevations that were given to us by landscape. This is actually when uh, myself, uh, I became familiar with Lauren Schmidt's work uh, that she was doing with Dynamo and how to basically use Dynamo to create a more accurate 3D model for site and landscape. Uh, using routines that we got straight from Lauren's blog, we started an exercise of first shape editing a massive floor based on the spot elevations that landscape gave us and then taking secondary floors over the top of them and conforming them or draping them over uh, the other landscape or the other floor object that we had placed in the model. Uh, and all of this uh, brain power obviously was, was Lauren's doing. We took it right off of her blog that she had so graciously shared with the community. And that became basically the backbone for how we've done all of our site and landscape modeling to date. But of course, now uh, we want to look at, you know, what the ambition for landscape modeling could be. And of course, this is a model uh, that Lauren has actually put together where you'll see all the typical elements that we don't always see inside a Revit site and landscape model, which is uh, sidewalks and roads that are sloped properly. There are curb cuts, there are curbs. Uh, planting is properly bound and populated throughout the entire model. And these are kind of uh, the images that are the story that we want to tell uh, with Foreground, which we've been working on for, I believe, the last nine months now. Uh, so with that, uh, that's kind of our brief uh, background and uh, how we got to where we are. So, you know, now we're going to jump into the much more fun uh, live demo. So I am going to stop my screen share. Uh, and Lauren, hopefully that allows you to just jump right in with yours. All right. Everyone can see and, and hear. Yep, hopefully. we can. And we can. 
All right. Yeah. So I apologize if this sounds like there's a frog in my throat. <laughs> there has been the past couple of days. So I'm going to try to do my best here, but Aaron might need to jump in if, if I start coughing. We'll see. Yeah. So as Aaron said, yeah, foreground is built on, yeah, the last, as, as a landscape architect, uh, it's built on, yeah, my past seven, eight years of experience of working in Revit and modeling sites and landscapes in Revit. And it's it's designed to be a, a complete tool set for architects or landscape architects to kind of design and document sites or landscapes directly in Revit. Um, and so we have, you'll see up here on the ribbon, we have several different tool sets. We have topography, we have floor or slabs as we call them. We have some hardscape helper, quick pick tools, planting tool set, and then some, some annotation tools as well. So we're gonna we're gonna kind of skip the topography tools initially and we can come we'll come back to a couple of them. Um, <clears throat> but the idea with the topography tools is more as Aaron mentioned that the yeah, topography is kind of limited in how it can be used in Revit. Um, so we're we're kind of starting with a, a topography built in kind of a more traditional way, either with an import or any sort of method you can use to make topography. Uh, and we're going to jump into the hardscape tools and go from there. So, so we're going to start here with drape slabs, which is our big, kind of our big uh, heavy lifter here in the, in the slab tools. So yeah, drape slabs basically allows you, and when we say slabs, we mean floors or roofs, either or. Um, and drape lets you drape floors or roofs onto topography, or you can drape them onto floors or roofs themselves as well. And then, so I can start out, I can pick a whole set of slabs here, and then it's gonna have to think about it. You might see a little bit of thinking since I have so many slabs. And then it automatically tries to find a host. You can see it grabs that topography as, as the host. I can change it if it's the wrong host. Uh, it's gonna default to a topography, but you can change it. And then, then we get down into our point calculation methods. So there's a couple of different things here. So we start out with the exterior or the boundary points. Um, and this is kind of the bare minimum of all the boundary points of, of the slabs. You can do the boundary points at intersecting contour lines. And so you can see wherever there's a contour line, um, it's gonna get that intersection and it's gonna add that. Um, or you can do a specified interval, which is the interval down here. I'm gonna use intersecting contour lines. That's my preferred method usually. And then you can also get interior points. First option is none. You can get all of the interior points within the topography and you can see it starts to grab those. Or you can also do an interval along the those topography lines. But for simplicity, I'm not gonna do any, in any interior points for this. And then there's some options where you can do an offset. It's gonna default to the thinnest slab you have um, and you can do some resetting. So I'm just gonna run this now and we'll see. I was gonna think about it for a few seconds here. And then these guys are all up up here on the, the topo surface. And you can see because I didn't grab any of those interior points, um, yeah, there's some spots where the topography is overlapping. So what we can do is we can go back and we can grab shape topo, which is kind of the inverse option. Um, and it allows you to pick multiple slabs again. And it's gonna it's gonna modify the topo to the underside of that slab. And it uses that interval. I'm just gonna run that. And you can see it cleans, it cleans up those areas pretty nicely. So moving on here, we're gonna jump back over to the slab editors. So one of one of the complaints that we often hear um, from once if you're working with shape edited slabs, if you start editing a boundary of a shape edited slab, um, you're going to start getting some really weird results because uh, it, it will reset those points down down to zero. Um, let's see if this works here. And so fixed points is a tool that we've come up with to kind of automatically to fix that. 
and bring that back up. So what it does is it just interpolates those points and it brings them all back up to the elevation that they should be. So that's fixed points. And then let's see, moving down, down the line here. Another, another fun tool that we like to show off is the, the curb tool, which essentially creates curbs from, from railings. Uh, the advantage of using a railing as a curb is that um, a railing is a profile just pushed along a path and it will stay hosted to the edge of a slab uh, if that slab is modified. So a curb is pretty basic. You select a railing type. I'm going to pick the entire segment because it goes a lot faster. And then you can pick edges and it's going to generate that railing as a curb along the edge of uh, road here. I hit escape and you can see it's just a it's a pretty basic railing, pretty simple profile. Uh, and then from there I can also use a line and align to that edge. So I'm gonna swoop around here so we can see a little bit better. Um, align edges has a couple of different options. You can align to slabs, you can align to edges. I'm going to just align to edges. So I'm going to modify this slab. And then from here, you can pick, you can pick a lot of different hardscape edges. And we have it set up so you can pick wall edges, you can pick curb edges, you can pick stair edges. You can pick other slab edges also. I'm just going to grab these edges here along the back side of the curb to bring the sidewalk up. And then you can see it's, uh, yeah, it's telling me that it found those edges, it found those points, I'm gonna run it. And now the, the sidewalk is, is flush with that curb along there. So yeah, the, are just to kind of recap, the slab tools are are kind of focused on being able to do a lot of grading and hardscape or softscape editing directly in Revit. So yeah, that's where that's where grade comes in. Also, so grade edges also has a couple of different options. Um, you can use it to just move sets of edges up and down. Uh, you can use it the slopes edges, but I'm going to do kind of the combination, which is an adjust and slope. And so the way this works is I'm going to pick a set of edges to move. So I'm going to move the end of this road. And then I'm going to grab both sides of the roadway. Um, this is these are the edges that I want to slope. I'm going to go. I'll stop there for now. So then I can set that at zero, but I'm going to set that at two feet. And then you can see if I uncheck the specify slope, it's going to calculate out what it takes to return those back to the slab, which is around 3%. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to set it at 2.5. And then I'll run that. And you can see, yeah, that. The, that curb adjusts with the slab, which is one of the, the main advantages of using curbs or using railings as curbs. And then if I go ahead and throw some quick spot slopes on there, yeah, you can see these edges are now all 2.5%, uh, at least along the segments that I selected. Yeah, that guy had to return to the slab, so he's a little different. All right, so that's kind of the slab tools in a nutshell. We have a few more. We have you have some point modifiers that let you adjust points up and down. We have the split and merge, similar to the topography split and merge tools. Um, I'm gonna swing back behind the building here and show off a few of the quick quick tools. So yeah, in addition to curve, we also have stair and wall. Um, which are similar but more complex because walls and stairs are more complex. Um, so the stairs, 
looks kind of complex, but essentially you pick an edge to start your stair from, and it's gonna start building and previewing that stair for you. You can build it from the base, you can build it from the top. Um, you can put in the stair height here, or you can grab another edge uh, to have it calculate out that height for you. You can flip it, end it with the riser or not. And then you can change the type. The tread depth will default um, to the type, the minimum depth, but then you can change it also. And same with the width. It's, the width is going to default to that edge length, but then you can change it. And then you can change, change the alignment also. Back up to 20, and then you set the railing, and then you can run it, and it's going to build that stair for you. And then it's just, it's just a rabbit stair, just like you'd expect it to be. Walls are similar, um, in that you pick a set of edges. So I'm going to go ahead and pick a set of edges, and you can pick on multiple slabs with walls. And then you can see it starts to preview those walls also. Um, you can change, we change the type. It's going to grab that thickness of that wall and the preview. And then you can, you can flip it to either side of your edge there. And then, yeah, there's a couple different build methods. You can set the top or bottom to be stepped or constant. Let's see if I set the top to constant. I need to see if I know what my elevations are here. Yeah, it's not quite right. But I'm going to step those and run that, and then it's going to make make walls all along there that have that two and four foot. So most of them are in the six foot range, but they're gonna they're gonna vary, especially along these slopes. You can see. Ironically, this exact topic came up in a conversation on LinkedIn uh, just this morning, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, so yeah, it's super fun to be talking about it in the demo with the uh, retaining walls and the stepping them along the the topography. Yeah, I'm, I apologize if my if I need to be a little louder. Um, yeah, I I'm recovering from a, a really bad sore throat, but I will do my best. <laughs> okay, so that are that's we're gonna move on to planting from there. Um, I'm gonna toggle over to my planting plan and got planting turned on over here pull this over. So yeah, we're doing planting. Um, we have a whole kind of set of planting tools here. And there's kind of, I like to explain it as we have like several different layers in the planting tool set. The first layer being the plant mixes. Um, I have a few mixes already in here, but essentially a mix, the mixes are built on uh, planting families that are loaded in the project. So I have, I have a couple of mixes in here. So you can see there's, there's a grass mix. It has a spacing. It has, it has the plant types in here. It has, they have percentages set to them. Uh, you can modify them from here or delete them. And then once you have a mix created, you can, you can use it in the placement tools in the project. So I can fill area being the first here. So you can, you can choose just a straight species, so I'll do that for this one. Um, and then you can select an area. An area is either a floor, a room, or an area. But these are rooms. Um, you can change the spacing, and it's gonna it's gonna update that point preview for you. It can be a grid spacing. Um, you can change the wiggle, which is one of Aaron's favorite <laughs> features. Which is ironic as an architect, I always find. But essentially, wiggle amount is like a randomization 
threshold. So if I set that to one foot, it's going to start randomizing those points, both in the x, y direction um, within that amount. Or you can just set it to zero, and it's going to be that perfect, perfect grid. And then you can see it, it grabs a host for you, similar to what some of the other tools for it do. It tries to default to a topography, but it can host, uh, it actually can't host to a roof. It can host to a floor or to a to topography. And then you can change the direction of the uh, array spacing. So I can pick an edge to set it to array along that edge. And then I can run it, and then it's going to place those plants. And then kind of the next layering that we do is that uh, we uh, we have a, essentially a database on the back end that we're managing that we're we're keeping track of these associations or what we call groups of plants. It's not actually a Revit group, but we kind of we call them a group just for nomenclature simplicity. So we have fill area. I can go ahead and do the same thing again. I'll use a mix. If I select that area, it's going to lock out the spacing because the mix, the spacing is set by the mix. And then I'll go ahead and just run that. And uh, yeah, so that's fill area. Place along is similar, except you place along lines instead. So I'm going to go ahead, do some along these lines over here. We're going to place these trees. 20 foot interval sounds good. I can do the same thing. Over here, the lines don't need to be continuous. They can be multiple sets. Let's cut off over there. And then the third kind of um, so those are both our placement tools, and then sometimes you want to manual place, manually place the plants itself, but then um, we can keep track of kind of the tagging and the updating from there. So you can assign the as an area or as a linear um, type. I'm going to do a linear type, and then you can pick the plants in order. And then uh, you can choose to have connector lines or not. Um, they can be lines or they can be arcs. And you can flip those arcs um, so that when I run it, it's going to basically it just makes detail lines that connect those. Um, and that those are also associated with, with the group itself. So they'll update. Yeah. So we're just a, of, another we're brief getting a lot note. of plant questions, Aaron. I don't know if we want to stop and yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I've been trying to answer a few of them uh, in the chat when we can. And uh, yes, yeah, so I apologize by the way, just in terms of our our kind of funny situation for the demo. So Lauren is uh, slightly losing her voice, and I have a torrential downpour here. So if I get booted, that's what happened. Um, yeah. So uh, Lauren Brian did have a great question about the plant mixes. Um, we may just want to pop open that dialogue um, to show how that works briefly, but. One of the things I did want to mention, because this is a really interesting point for me, is when we were first starting to talk about foreground, uh, you had mentioned how, you know, in your landscape architecture work, you had used rooms or areas as kind of the boundaries for planting. And as somebody who worked in architecture, that was kind of foreign to me, because obviously we use them in buildings. So I think it's a really great point that uh, you guys have built these tools so that what it sees as an area can be either that floor or that roof or that room or that area, because ultimately what we want to do is not be limiting people to work exactly how we think they need to work. You know, they can work the way they're kind of used to already, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. But yeah, that one of the advantages I'll explain briefly about using either rooms or areas is that, um, they, you don't have to go into a sketch mode to edit them, um, and so you can just you can just change their boundary lines, and then they that area was going to update. So yeah, things get weirder when you start using splines, but I can I can edit those these shapes here, and uh, yeah, this one is maybe a better example. But yeah, I can drag this out, um, and then I can I can run my update. 
and it's going to update those guys based on those boundaries. I don't have to go in and edit the sketch, finish the sketch, and then if they share a boundary, go in and edit the, the adjoining boundary and edit that. Yeah. So that's the big advantage to rooms or areas, and rooms have a slight advantage over areas, and that areas require specialty area plans, which can be advantage or disadvantage depending on on how you view it. Uh, that's why these are rooms. Anyway. Um, so yeah, I can go back in and, and show the mixes really quick, and then we can get into some tagging and updating. Um, but yeah, there are two types of mixes. There's a simple and a complex mix. Um, a complex mix is essentially multiple layers, uh, and it, this is kind of still in testing. And so we're still trying to figure out exactly how complex mixes works. Simple mixes are a bit more straightforward and that essentially you give it a name, give it a spacing, and then you can add them by dropdown. All the plants appear here in the dropdown, or you can go add them from the model, which might be similar, or might be simpler depending on how many plants you have in your model. Um, so I can decide I want this one and this one, and then, then it's gonna pull them in here. And then you can set the percentages individually. Um, there's some little equality and remainder tools to help you depending on how you want to use them. Um, I'll just set that equal equal and then you save it out. And then it appears here in the drop down where you can edit it. And you can see the other ones are also here as well. Yeah, so we're not currently doing anything with a like, randomized rotation or anything that's very content specific. Um, we're trying to hold off on that for now. It might be something we include later or it might, we might be including it later with a planting library. Um, we do not sh ship a planting library with foreground. The idea is that you can use your own custom planting library. We are building out a planting library also that will work with foreground, um, but we want to give no. We're not going to give our users the flexibility to to use the families they want to use, or if they want to use ours, they can use ours as well. Um, yeah. So from there, we'll get into the tagging. Um, maybe I'll place fill a few more of these areas here. All right, and then, um, so yeah, we have updating and tagging for all the, the plant groupings. You can tag individually if you want, or you can do a tag all, which is gonna tag all of the groupings in the current view. Um, and it, it takes some defaults it, um, that are built into the plant annotation settings. Um, so it's taking the tag that's pulled in here. It's taking all of these kind of leader presets. And you can see it's pulling from the right side, um, which is what these are all doing. So you can see this one is, is tagged down here. These guys are all tagged up on the right. And from here, I, I, can, I can move and I can readjust these. Um, so you can use move tag. And I can, can move this guy down to here. I can move of these around so that they're a little cleaner. And maybe I'll do this as well. So Lauren, while you're adjusting those tags, uh, we do have a couple of uh, interesting questions in Q&A that I actually don't know the answer to. So uh, Scott Brown did just ask, uh, can you select multiple rooms to infill at one time, i.e. to fill it quickly and then come back later and change the plant mix? I'm actually not sure about the answer to that. Um, yeah, the, so the placement tools don't currently support multiple multiple like areas, um, but that is something that we could we could probably Add that pretty easily. Um, but yes, you can come back and edit after the fact. So there is an, uh, so I can show that off also. So yeah, there's a, there's a number of modified tools that let you modify after the fact. So if I want to come back 
to to this mix. Um, you can see, the, so the modify is going to populate with all the stuff that is currently attached to that grouping. So it has the area, it has the, the mix type. Um, so if I want to change it to this grass mix instead, um, and I can update it, and it's going to update from there. And then the same thing happens with plant mixes as well. So if I go into this plant mix and I grab that grass mix, um, so it's a, it's a 30 70 split right now, but if I want to equalize those out, I can update that mix. And then it's it's going to tell me I'm updating these three groups and it's going to update those. You can see it's updated them back there as well. So yeah, anytime you update a mix or any on any of the placement tools, it's going to be deleting and replacing those plants for you um, in order to, to make those updates. And so yeah, that how is it? Those, and then and then once you yeah you can modify the areas. Um, and if you, the same thing is true. So if I, for this manual grouping, if I modify that guy, or if I move that guy, and if I move these lines, um, the update tools will also catch all of those as well. I'll go ahead, drag that out. And I can do an update all. Yeah, and you can see for a manual grouping, it's gonna update the connector lines and the count of the plants, similar to this linear grouping, and yeah, the area ones are also, yeah. The tags will try to remain where you place them, but since it's replacing plants every time, it's no guarantee, um, depending on how complex your mix is, the tags will get kind of shuffled around. Uh, if they, the more they, the more that the mix changes, the more the tags will kind of might get a little shuffled up. So that is most of the planting. Yeah, there's a number of planting support tools in here. Um, you can find all of the plants that are in a grouping, and that's going to select all of those. You can select all of the plants in a grouping. Um, yeah, there's edit, and you can add or edit connector lines from there also. And then I'm moving along down the ribbon. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah, we have a couple kind of annotation helpers. So auto spots is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can pick multiple slabs and it has some spot elevation settings that are similar to the plant annotation settings. Um, you can decide if it has a leader. You can set the leader length. You can you can change. Oh, looks like it needs some. Yeah, that's that. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I don't have those slabs anymore. Um. Yeah, you can change that and it's going to update them from there. Looks like we need some more protections on that guy. Um, and then once you run it, it's going to place spot elevations at all of those, at all of those points um, as, as kind of a quick starting point for getting spot elevations. And then we also have um, for, for doing layout points and layout datums, we have um, a couple of tools. So the first, starting with kind of place datums, um, you can do a prefix or a suffix. I'm just going to do a simple prefix. Um, and then I'm going to tag on placement. So you can see I'm going to come along here. It doesn't tag until, until you close out of the datum placing. So I hit escape and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to tag those. And if I go back to place more, it's going to find kind of the next number in the sequence. So I can just pick up where I left off from there. And then datums also have a number 
of like updating and renumbering abilities. So you can see if I grab this datum, it has it has that number and it has northern and easting data that's pushed into it. Um, so if I if I need to move this guy, come on, datum. Um, So yeah, yeah, you can see it has like a 90. So if I update that, it's going to update that northern and easting at a minimum. Um, but then if I delete that one, there's there's a few different update settings. So you can have it automatically eliminate duplicates and gaps. The coordinate base point is based off of the survey point. You can change that to the project base point. Uh, you can choose what tag you're using also. So then if I update my datums, it's going to renumber from there. So it renumbered these ones along here. Yeah, so these are these are schedulable. These are elements. These are just site elements that can be scheduled. Um, and these are, we push some of these shared parameters into it so that they're there. But then you can also schedule and tag them as well. And then, yeah, there's unit support for changing units to meters, millimeters, and decimal feet is what we currently support. Um, I don't know if we want to backtrack and take questions as far as some other tools to see or what what we want to do, Aaron. Sorry, we were just uh, we were just answering some questions in the chat. Yeah, we were just briefly on LinkedIn having a talk about the datums uh, and the ability of like tagging them and you know having that data automatically show up and it's also compelling I mean not to go off on a tangent but considering the way um, the the plant group tags like automate having their leaders oriented the same way and whatnot it's it's really compelling for like field layout drawings to be able to just you know retroactively tag all of those datums and it's it's nice that you know we've got it all as shared parameter data for all that stuff as well so that's pretty exciting. Um, we do have a question uh, from Andrew about ETA on Revit 2022 availability. Yeah, extremely uh, shortly. I mean, we actually have it in 2022 right now. Um, we just caught a couple of things at the last minute that we need to update. So, I mean, we're expecting it. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to jinx us, but I mean, we're expecting it to be out in 22. You know, by next week. Yeah, we we had anticipated having it today, and then realized we probably shouldn't. <laughs> Very late in the game, but. Very, very soon. Uh, we also have a question about does it work in 2019 uh, from Scott Valentine. So yeah, I, I believe currently we have it in 2019 up through 2021. And then of course, 2022 will be next week. Um, and uh, mm -hmm. So Lauren, if, uh, if you don't mind showing it, and uh, um, one of the things I thought was interesting was when you were, when you were doing the sidewalk next to the road, um, I noticed that uh, you know, as part of the demo, you were showing great edges and how to raise one edge up to meet the road. But one of the really compelling tools that I enjoy is when I use drape and then I put you know the road and the sidewalk both on top of the terrain, um, and then I realize I just want to raise the entire sidewalk up uh, using the adjust points with the relative elevation. Um, and Scott Brown had asked a similar question earlier about do you have to know the actual elevation of everything. Um, in terms of like a sea level. So um, yeah, if you want to just grab that sidewalk with the, uh, with the adjust points tool, it's one of my favorites because this is one of the things that's a total hardship in architecture when we're just modeling sidewalks. Yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of different ways you could do it. If, if, if you knew you were only like bringing up a set of edges, you could, you could use a, adjust, you could use great edges and just like select those edges and bring them up. Um, you could also do it with adjust points or adjust area. Adjust points will do the whole slab. That's what adjust I meant. I'm sorry. I meant adjust points. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Adjust points will do the whole slab. Adjust area, you can isolate an area, but they're effectively the same thing. Um, so, yeah. So, if you know what the absolute elevation is, you can specify that, or if you if it's a relative change, um, like let's say it's three feet up or if it's half of a foot up, which is a more common <laughs> sort of change. And you could run that and it'll bring, it'll bring it all up. And then, yeah, there's also some options for picking edges if you don't actually know um, 
you could pick an elevation if you don't actually know what it is. Yeah, and then we have a couple of other, we kind of skipped over these topography tools, but since we have a little bit of time here at the end, I can, I can show them off a little bit. Um, we have some topo creation tools that allow you to create topography um, from several different methods. You can, you can create from a CAD link, the advantage being that then you can specify a point interval, which is not something you can currently do out of the box. Um, you can do a CSV or a land XML file, and you can change your coordinate base point, um, or you can do Revit model lines and you can make a whole topography using Revit model lines and specifying the point interval from, from there. So I was gonna do a quick demo of replace area, which is essentially has the same functionality as topo from, but it lets you modify an existing topography. So if you have if you have that CAD link and you know there's a certain area you want to isolate that's been updated, you can do that. Um, you can replace the entire topo surface if you want, or you can, I have some lines here that in plan are isolating this area. I'm going to use the Revit model lines, but again, we have all those options there. And I'm going to pick these are my topo lines here, which I've already set to the right elevation. Um, which we have a tool for that also, but I'm going to go ahead and run that. And then you can see it's going to, it's going to swap out all of the, it's going to basically wipe out the points from the topo in that area. And it's kind of a big topo. So it takes a second here to think about, think about that run times are going to vary, of course, depending on your topography. Um, but it just modified that topography with those lines. And then we have a modify area, which is similar to our kind of our adjust points. So it lets you just kind of adjust a set of points up or down or left or right or however much you want as well. But yeah, in general, our topography points, our topography tools focus on, on relatively simple modification and kind of augmenting some, some better creation tools. Um, Yeah, so we there is a set set line elevation which lets you grab grab the lines and then you can set the elevation using a step or using a start and end, um, and you can change the base level that they're hosted to as well. Um, yeah, that's funny. I actually forgot that feature was in there because when we started the early testing, uh, just to go back to Scott Brown's question about if they draft the contour lines. I remember uh, we already had topo from lines in there. So I drew all the lines and then I was in elevation, like moving them up. And I forgot you had created a tool right after that for actually setting the elevation. So, I mean, Scott, this is an, an even more interesting workflow because we've worked on some reconciliation projects where we literally had to trace the contours with splines and then manually set the elevation. So having that set line elevation tool to be able to do that, we could literally draw lines, set elevation, create topo, drape slabs, and then sacrifice the topo. And we could be off to the races. It's really exciting. Yeah, so so shape topo is, is currently limited to slabs, but I think that will be, there's a question about adding, adding features is that, yeah, we'll be looking to, to incorporate a few other things like edges and lines into shape topo as well. Um, so we'll have a few more options for adding whatever sort of points you want to add from any sort of element. Um, it currently doesn't have that, but we'll be looking to. Yeah, so I know we've been trying to uh, answer most of the questions through the chat um, and in the uh, Q&A as well, but we did want to leave some time uh, at the end of the demo in case there are uh, other, you know, kind of big picture questions you guys want us to go over, or if there's any features that anybody wants to see like another, you know, more intense dive into. So I'm just going to spend a minute reviewing the Q&A and the chat and see if we uh, missed anything. So uh, Trey Klein is asking, will this play nicely with bridges and tunnels brought in via the import civil structures tool? I have to admit, I am not sure of the answer of that. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't think we've had any um, testers that have that. So um, we can we can look into it. So um, sorry. So Trey, I will look into that. Um, I will get with a couple of people that we know are are using the import civil structures tool, and I'll see if we can get a sample file. My my knee jerk reaction is I don't think you know, one of the things that we've tried to be pretty cognizant of while uh, Lauren and John have been you know putting this tool together is we're trying not to do anything really wild as far as Revit's concerned. So my, my kind of knee-jerk reaction is that we shouldn't be doing anything that would cause a conflict or an issue with import civil structures, because really we're just doing basic, I don't wanna say basic, but we're just, we're basically enhancing shape editing for objects that already exist and then expediting a lot of other processes that are done manually. So, so my, I, I hope there isn't an issue there. Uh, Sorry, I'm just reading a couple more questions. Uh, so we've had a number of questions uh, wanting to um, wanting to revisit the subject of the patterns on uh, the hardscape elements. And um, again, I know I've said this in the chat a few times, but you know, for everybody who's in attendance, I would just uh, stay tuned for updates in the future. We are obviously painstakingly aware of the issue of the patterns on the hardscape elements and yes we're aware that there's an issue there and it's being investigated So I'm also uh, just a couple of comments that, that I that I think are kind of interesting. So so Radu and uh, interfacing with Civil 3D, uh, Civil 3D, uh, you know, and Revit interaction has always kind of been an interesting and frustrating one for me. I love Civil 3D models. I love seeing them in Navisworks, um, and I love like coordinating them with our with our Revit models. And so you know, our hope though has always been that you know bringing things into Revit from Civil 3D, we've never really gotten the same fidelity that exists in Civil 3D. So, you know, that's kind of why, you know, we wanted to break it down into, you know, if we just start with the data from the topo, because largely that's generally what we get when somebody brings something in from Civil 3D and everything turns kind of like a, like a curtain draped over all of the, you know, the high fidelity Civil 3D objects. So it's nice for us to be able to kind of recompile it all as Revit objects. Um, yet certainly not automated at this point in time you know, using all these commands to replicate what's in Civil 3D. But our hope is to get to a quality model. Um, while that's not really interfacing with Civil 3D, it's a bit closer than we've been um, in the past. Uh, Lauren, uh, how do you feel about uh, talking about contour lines? Yeah, I, I think so similar to kind of the the floor pattern fix and and even contour lines is yeah, what we're focused on on kind of this first release definitely we're focused on kind of augmenting what Revit already does out of the box. Um, but we, yeah, we're looking into further fixes for those both of those items as they're kind of big hardscape grading issues um, but we're also kind of yeah trying to keep an eye on on autodesk development as well just to try to dovetail our efforts and be efficient as, as possible um, we do have a feature request form within foreground so um, you can suggest ideas here and yeah we have we have a running list of of ones that we are trying uh, to prioritize for future releases. I'm actually going to see um, if I can get to the feature request form so that I can post a link in the chat. Um, Unless you want to do that, not to put you on the spot, just because you have Revit opened at the moment, uh, do you want to do you want to go to help and hit that uh, that feature suggest ideas, and then if you want to just paste that link into 
There it is. Nice. So uh, thank you, Lauren, for posting that. Um, nothing like having me try to drive over voice over Zoom. <laughs> um, so yeah, inside the app, there is obviously the, the feature request form. There's also the submit bugs thing. And both of those just go to our actual help desk uh, into foreground. So you can suggest ideas there. Uh, so, so Trey is also asking, are building pads and subregions still used? Um, so I think depending on which of the five of us at Parallax you ask, you may get a few different answers on this. Uh, and, and the reason for that is um, it, so, so for me selfishly, when I'm working with contractors, the primary function is to get everything into a solid model instead of using Revit Topo because I need the thickness and I need to compare it with what's underneath. So for me, even when it comes to building pads uh, and retaining elements around like basements and buildings, I tend to use things like walls and floors and roofs and, and whatnot. And um, for me, I consider the model complete when all the topo is gone and I've uh, supplanted it with basically roofs or floors. So for me personally, uh, building pads and subregions aren't still used, but um, you know that's also a lot different from what a landscape architect will be doing. Yeah, I think I think we leave it open to however our users want to use it. I mean, you can still use building pads and subregions. Um, there's a lot of issues with subregions, like they they do really strange things to topography. They they disrupt the triangulation in really strange ways along curves and all sorts of things. And building pads always have an associated subregion. Um, so yeah, you can you can still use them. We're not doing very much with them other than trying to keep an eye on them in our tools, but, but yes. I would also say uh, we, we've posted a couple of teaser videos uh, on our YouTube channel, just, you know, through earlier foreground development. Um, but, and this is kind of just a random different, different uh, subject, but um, there is some really neat functionality built into the split and merge functions as well, um, that if you guys go catch the videos on, on YouTube, you'll be able to see it working. And, um, and it goes back to a comment that Brian had asked earlier in the chat, just about like, if you want to crown a road or if you want to make certain kinds of edits, how would that be done? And uh, going back to kind of the way the tools are built, how they're really just expediting native Revit tools, these tools can kind of be layered on top of one another. So in our earlier sample file, where there was a parking lot in the corner of two roads, um, I had actually gone through and done a bunch of the align edges, grade edges, plane slab, whatnot. Then I decided to basically merge the two together. And so, you know, it merges two shape edited slabs together um, and doesn't lose the shape editing and then splitting does the exact opposite. So um, yeah, it's it's a pretty compelling set of tools. You should go check out those videos as well, just because it's it's interesting to see how you'll be able to layer the tools together. And then we have a question from Scott ba Brown about the draping of floor over floor. And essentially, yeah, drape, the way drape works is it, it's looking for all the points um, from its host, um, all the interior points, but it also is projecting like all of its boundary points on the host. Um, so it, do, it essentially acts the same as it does on a topography is that it's, it's going to project all those boundary points and then it's also going to get all those interior points if you select the interior points. Um, so it's very similar, uh, like the, the contour line functionality doesn't work because there's no contour lines in a floor. Um, but it's still, if you're doing all of the boundary points and interior points, it, a slab is going to follow a slab. And then you can choose how you want to offset if you want to offset that up or you can offset that down above or below that slab. Um, it's up to you. Yeah, so I also see that we have a question about uh, how is foreground different or better than environment for Revit? Uh, so uh, to be honest, uh, you know, we kind of started out listing our tool set and what we thought uh, all the tools needed to be based on how Lauren felt that uh, landscape modeling needed to work. Uh, and we went from there. Um, obviously, we can't speak uh, very intelligently about how, you know, the other application is developed or how it works. Uh, we haven't had uh, really any conversations with those folks about how their app works. So, yeah, I, I echo Scott's comments. Um, I, I recommend all of you, you know, to, to trial both apps and, you know, see what's working for you. And everybody's workflow is going to be a bit different. 
Um, so, you know, we do have 30-day uh, trials starting uh, with foreground. Um, so I encourage all of you to just, you know, try, you know, the applications out and see how they're working for you. And, and then there, we have one more question about tag customization. Um, and the, the way the tagging is set up is that you can you choose the tag that you're using. Um, so you can load whatever tag you want and you set the tag that you're using and um, you can use that way you can use whatever internal tags you might have with any other shared parameters um, that you might also have. So I, I think, I hope that answers that question. Actually a super practical question uh, from Marta. So I, I do know that uh, the product is live on the website and they can click to buy it. Um, but I do know that I, I believe we mentioned that there is a trial available. I know I mentioned it a minute ago. Um, is the, let me see if I go to the website. How do they access the trial? So my understanding is, yeah, you. It says buy. Um, it doesn't. And John can chime in on this. I think he knows the the back end a bit better than I do. But essentially, yeah, it it doesn't charge you until the trial completes. Is that right, John? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's right. So whenever you navigate through the portal, it will actually let you have that 30 day trial and then you'll get an email at 30 days that says, hey, do you want to continue the subscription? So, yep, that's how that works. And we have other apps that do trials as well. And that's, that's kind of how it's set up. Awesome, thanks for weighing in. Well, yeah, so um, if any of you have any more questions, uh, we uh, highly recommend you or encourage you to email them to us or reach out to any of us on social media. Uh, or like we said, um, feel free to contact us directly uh, or you can go through the website and you can kick off your 30-day trial. Um, Trey's also asking, when will this be available for Revit 2023? <laughs> uh, since... since uh, yeah, when 2023 is out. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. And we hope you guys are uh, going to, uh, you know, uh, kick its tires a bit and uh, start modeling some awesome sites. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we're going to wrap it up. So uh, reach out to us and uh, we hope to talk to you guys soon. Bye, everybody.